Hi, everyone. Good afternoon. Uh, my name is Josh Zakem. I am the executive director of Housing for and Mass. Want to welcome you to our very first uh, training session, obviously a virtual training, uh, as we are all social distancing and, and being careful out there. This training uh, is going to be focused on legislation uh, for lay people, part of our advocacy for all series, which I think is a really important toolkit for being advocates uh, for you know, pro, pro housing advocates to create a better, uh, stronger environment for growth and affordable and workforce housing here in Massachusetts. We are going to launch uh, quickly with a, a short video from a couple of our founding board members and then Kristen Halbert, uh, who is a dynamic trainer, uh, activist and field organizer in Massachusetts is going to lead us through this process. So we'll start the video shortly and get right into it. Thanks. be one of the founding board members of Housing Forward Massachusetts. Um, and this is the beginning of our series of sessions on advocacy for all. Um, my background is that I, for 12 years, I was a co-CEO of what is now Mass Housing. Before that, I spent a whole career at HUD. And for the last 25 years, I've been president of Housing Partners, Inc., an affordable housing consulting firm. So you can see I've been doing this literally for decades, and I couldn't be happier that we're providing training for more people to become advocates for affordable, mixed income, workforce, and market housing in the communities of Massachusetts. Um, Please make sure to give us feedback after the session is over. Since we're just starting, we'd love to know what we're doing well and what we could improve on. And have a great session. Thanks for coming. Hello, I'm Barry Bluestone, and I am very proud to be the president of Housing Forward Massachusetts. Um, it's a new organization committed to making sure we have the housing and the affordable housing we need in the Commonwealth. Uh, I've been involved in housing work for oh, most of my life, but particularly over the last 25 years at Northeastern, where I was director of the Dukakis Center, and I was the dean of the School of Public Policy. And while we were there at the Dukakis Center, uh, we were very um, proud of the fact that for 15 years we produced the Greater Boston Housing Report Card, often with my colleague Eleanor White. Uh, we would look at uh, what was happening to production, we'd look at what was happening to prices, to rents, um, and then also trying to figure out what types of uh, advocacy, what kinds of legislation would make it possible to meet the goals we set. What I've learned in all those years is that citizen ad advocacy uh, citizen action is as important as legislative action. We need people to get involved. We need people to be educated. We need people to understand the housing needs we have. And we also have to um, take a look at what the real housing issues are because sometimes we don't quite understand them. People in the suburbs are sometimes worried about new multifamily housing, thinking that all kinds of new people will come into their neighborhood. Well, with a lot of baby boomers like myself who are retiring, we're downsizing and we want to stay in our community, but we don't have the housing choice that we need in our community. Uh, so we need to work on those kinds of issues. I want to thank all of you for attending uh, this uh, virtual meeting, and I hope you'll stay tuned to what Housing Forward Massachusetts uh, is doing now and will do in the future. Hello, I'm Barry Bluestone, and I am very proud to be the president of Housing Forward Massachusetts. Um, it's a new organization committed to making sure we have the housing and the affordable housing we need in the Commonwealth. Uh, I've been involved in housing work for oh, most of my life, but particularly over the last 25 years. Okay. Hi, 
Hi guys, as uh, Executive Director Zakem had announced previously, my name is Kristen Halbert. I'm a local Boston activist, organizer, and trainer focused on making sure that everybody is kind of leveled up, skilled up, and has the knowledge and skills that they need to go forth and to advocate. And one of the first things that we need for advocating is definitely having an understanding of how the systems and the processes work. So I'm here to guide you through the legislative process on both local and state levels in order to make sure that you're equipped to make this change that we want. So let's get started right now by looking at the different places and types of representation that you can count on when you are advocating. And I just want to make sure, can everyone see the presentation right now? Could I get some thumbs up? Or thumb, <laughs> thumbs up? Okay, perfect. Glad to hear it. And one... All right. Oh, some people are being really fancy, like they're actually using the thumbs up <laughs> logos. And I'm going to need that for later, because if you do have a question at any point during this training, feel free to put it right into the chat. If I see it and I can answer it quickly, I'll definitely interrupt and do that. Otherwise, when we're at the end, feel free to raise those blue hands and put any questions that you have, and we'll try to answer as many as we possibly can in the time allowed. So let's look first at the level of government that everyone's most familiar with just based on news coverage, and that's going to be your congressional level. At the congressional level, you have a one uh, representative for your district, but you also have two senators, and those people take care of everything statewide. This is probably the level people are most familiar with, again, just because of the news coverage and how we look at it, but they're actually the most removed from your local day-to-day -day experience. You do go to your reps for if you're looking for help with a federal agency, perhaps citizenship and immigration services, the IRS, or veteran affairs. As a body, they also create the minimum enforceable standards for our concerns like air and water quality, safe working conditions, or the federal minimum wage. It's more likely, however, that you are going to need help at a local level. And that's why we're always gonna to try to engage with our local legislators because they can actually go further than our federal standards and they're better tailored to each locality's issues. Always think of the federal government as the absolute bare minimum that everyone has to adhere to. And if you would like more than that, you should look at your state and your municipal government to make those changes. Speaking of state, if you are knowledgeable about how the federal level works, the structure of government at the state house is gonna seem really familiar. Here, instead of two, you have one state senator, which is also bounded by district. You also have one state representative. Your state house legislators are working together constantly to create probably most popular our budget or the appropriations bill, but that also funds a lot of the work that we do inside of our cities and towns. They also govern the creation and management of taxes, state roads and parks, and initiatives like the Massachusetts Rental Voucher Program. If you would like to find your particular national and state representation, you're gonna to go to where do I vote MA for more information. Now, I'm going to say several different websites or things during the presentation, but don't worry because these websites are also listed on your handout. Just to remind you, the state house is really more for statewide legislation and statewide initiatives. They can't actually create laws just for their own town or just for their city independently. There is a mechanism for that that we're gonna talk about a little bit later. But again, if you wanna make a change that affects the entire state, feel free to go to that state house legislator. But more likely, you're actually going to be dealing with your actual day-to-day -day citizen representative, and that's our municipal level. I don't know if you guys knew this, but there are actually 39 cities and 312 towns in the 14 counties here in Massachusetts. So that means that the majority of all the legislators in our state are actually found at the municipal level. 
And a lot of these issues can just be solved by engaging with your mayor, your city council, or even your select person. And I am talking about things that range all the way from trash pickup on your street and street cleaning services, all the way over to items like zoning and where housing is and how we're going to engage further in processes that are going to make your day-to-day -day life a little bit easier and a little bit better for you. We also refer to these generally as quality of life concerns, which are really much the bread and butter of your municipal legislators. Now, depending on the size of your town, you might have a different style of legislation and style of government. So next time that you are in a small town and you're going to a neighborhood dentist or to a grocery store, if you have part-time legislation, like a select person, that person who's bagging your, um, your groceries or that person who's filling your cavity could also be the same person who decides your zoning laws or has a fairly large hand in the budget. This is because a lot of towns and cities don't actually need the ability to have a full-time legislator. So you could have a part-time or a full-time person. Now, when you move into our cities, for the most part, they do have full-time city councils and full-time mayors, and in some cases, full-time city managers. Um, when I talk about size, the differentiation is really that the smallest city still needs a minimum resident total of about 12,000 residents if you're a city, but there's no upper end on that. Framingham, as you might have known, is one of our most recent municipalities to change over from a town style of government to a city style of government, because at 70,000 people, it was actually one of the largest towns inside of America. And when we explain how town government works for the city, you can see how this might have been a little bit of an issue to get our laws and our legislation passed. If you're in Cambridge, Lowell or Worcester, actually hands up if we have anyone from Cambridge, Lowell or Worcester somewhere inside this chat. Just want to check and see if I'm talking to my own people. Okay. Hey, hi, Josh. <laughs> You actually not only have a mayor, but you also have a city manager, and that's a person that's hired by that legislative body to actually kind of take care of the day to day running of the city. And in Cambridge in particular, your mayor actually comes from your city council. It is not just elected by the people, it's elected by the people by the representative of the people. Now you can see why this can be a little bit confusing and you're really going to have to go to your particular city or uh, town website if you want to learn a little bit more about your structure. If you go to the Secretary of State's website, also this is listed on that handy handout, uh, you can find the uh, phone number, website, and the uh, how to talk to your clerk for any of the municipalities here in Massachusetts. So, Depending on that municipality, your counselors or your select person, they'll meet with their fellow members anywhere from monthly to weekly. These meetings will follow a set agenda and they can deal with matters that they've been ruminating for a while or things that happen very quickly and without warning so that they can provide emergency legislation to the body. And the agenda is often posted before our meetings and the meetings are generally open to the public. You can put forth hearing orders, resolutions to state positions or perhaps to honor the great work of one of your citizens or community leaders. And you can also report out on hearings so that it could be uh, called for a vote or even sent back to the different committees. And here are just a couple of other examples of those day-to-day -day concerns, but also some other works that they do inside of these hearings, which include confirm appointments to boards and commissions, amend zoning laws, and I think what everyone here is uh, most concerned about generally, which is approving a budget. <laughs> In addition to when they work with their fellow counselors on issues like zoning, transportation, and matters of city policy, legislators also serve on committees and they do specific types of legislation and special projects as needed. This means that they also engage with representatives from other cities if they feel that they might not be up on some of the lingo or some of the work that everyone else is doing and they would like to bring it into their particular municipality. And some of these committees don't exist all the time. They only exist part of the time. For instance, a census committee might only have to exist every decade or so, but a housing and development committee is most likely a standing committee, which is one that meets consistently. 
Legislators that serve on those committees might also have their staff research certain positions, upcoming ordinances, and meet with local stakeholders or talk to representatives from other cities that have undertaken similar projects. And they'll also discuss concerns with residents who might be affected by those committees. If you have a particular item that you're interested, whether it might be housing or transportation or food security, do yourself a favor and go to your municipality's website and see who your local legislator is that leads that committee. It's a great start for getting involved. Our committee members are also a little bit more well-versed on their subject matter than your common legislator, but you can also see this happening at all levels of government. So, as I said earlier, towns have a little bit of a different meeting style than a city does with city council. It's really easy to remember because it's literally called town meeting. And town meeting just means that if a town has fewer than 6,000 residents, then they have an open town meeting. And that's where everyone can vote on the matters. When I said earlier that your legislators were mostly gonna come from municipal levels, it's because not only are legislators the people that we elect on election day, but in a town, a small town, if you have a town meeting style that's open, you are the legislator. You are the person that is actually voting on all of everything that's coming forward, whether it's budget, zoning amendments, or even more. So I think it's really important, again, for you to make sure that you go and understand your town style to see if you are electing somebody else to represent you, or if you just haven't gotten the chance to represent yourself first. So if there is a larger town than 6,000, we call that representative town meeting. And that means that you can actually vote for somebody to be a town meeting member and to represent you and to do those votes. As we said with Framingham as an example of over 70,000 people, it would be pretty difficult, even if you only had a 50% attendance rate, to really get those votes and to hear from all 35,000 people that might have showed up. So town meeting styles that have representatives are really important and to make sure that those people get out there and still do the some of the work that you would find for a select person, alderman, or a counselor of really learning what everyone else in their municipality feels is the best way to vote for any of these. So everyone has a direct vote and you must use open meeting format in less than 6,000. But if you have more than 6,000, you actually have a full choice between open and representative as well as electing those town meeting members. And just to remind you, you have to collect those signatures ahead of time. You can't just show up suddenly and decide to be involved, not for this one thing. And you cannot announce your intentions when you are at these meetings. So town, any town law, by the way, um, are governed by their own personal charters and bylaws, um, but many of the restrictions that are placed on the operations actually list inside of our Massachusetts general laws. Now, I would never want you to go into a situation that you weren't prepared for. So let's go over a little bit of what you should expect at an annual town meeting. Now, these happen, according to our own legislature, have to happen at least once a, a year. And this is where you're actually going to talk about things like the budget, capital expenditures, zoning changes, town bylaw changes, and compensation or even the acquisition or disposition of public land. Now, this is why it's very important and it also can take a very long time. Be prepared to strap in, especially if you only have one annual meeting and you don't have what's known as special town meetings in between. Also, if you want to figure out where these things are when they're happening, you're going to go to your clerk's office and you can just ask them when annual town meeting is coming. You can also look in traditional ways of finding things. They will post it in newspapers of records. You should also check community bulletin boards or neighborhood association groups. All three of these sources should be able to tell you when these meetings are coming up. So, Besides all this business that gets taken care of, we all can learn about what's going to come next by looking at the agenda. Now, an agenda for a town meeting actually is referred to as the warrant. So when the warrant is posted, um, and it's usually prepared by town council, which is very straightforward. It's just the lawyer who works with the town or the staff, and or they could even be a private lawyer that simply keeps the town as or retains the town as a client and the select persons will post the warrant, which indicates that the meeting is coming up. And on the warrant, 
all the different agenda items are just referred to as articles. And each article deserves a vote and each article can have a significant amount of discussion. Voters can also put items on that warrant as long as they collect enough signatures, at least 10 registered voters, and then annual meetings, by the way, just in case you're keeping track of these calendars, they have to ha happen by June 30th of every single year. Now, you also should be aware that every single town has a slightly different way of figuring out when they should be starting these town meetings. Sometimes they have a quorum requirement of 50%, 25%, 10%, or any other number of particular registered voters. Other towns can have a quorum as low as zero, which means as long as one person even shows up, they can just start off with business. So like everything, being on time is late, being early is being on time. So make sure that you get to these town meetings and these other ways of engaging on time to make sure that you are not missing out on anything. But once you get there, I bet you're wondering where will you get to actually weigh in and engage on the legislation that you've suddenly gotten interested in. And there's actually a lot of different ways and areas to do this. Now, each division of local government varies with regard to how and when they take public comment. So let's look at a couple of these avenues on our municipal level first. The simplest way to weigh in is to contact your mayor, your counselor, or your select person directly. Now, this could be sending an email, it could be calling your office, or even arranging an in-person meeting with the elected or staff at any time of year. Obviously, in times of coronavirus, you are more likely to have a call, email, or a Zoom meeting be the best way that you're engaging with them at this moment. But to let you know, in case you do feel a little bit apprehensive about this, Here's a secret. Legislators actually love hearing from their constituents. Let me say that one more time. The person that you elected to represent you actually wants to hear about you because it's going to help them do their job a little bit better. So if there is an upcoming decision that you feel that you want to weigh in on, feel free to just jump right in there and give that office a call. Now, when people think of actually sharing an opinion with a large body, or again, as we've been conditioned by the media for what sharing your opinion means, you're probably thinking of testifying at a hearing. And a hearing is simply a meeting to learn more about a matter that's brought forth um, in front of the legislative body. And the matter could be a new proposed ordinance, disbursement of funds, or a quality of life issue like uh, sound or trash collection or things like this. For cities, once a hearing has been called and it's your issue on the agenda, you might want to give public testimony so that all of the representatives, as well as those in attendance, hear your concerns. Always be thoughtful about your public testimony, though, because it is actually a matter of public records law. So anything that you do say inside of these public hearings could be taken taken down and accessed by anybody at any time uh, as long as they do a Freedom of Information Act request. So be thoughtful, be honest, and definitely still be engaged. So this could mean you can do everything from writing a letter ahead of time or you can actually speak during the session that has a uh, public testimony. But whichever way that you choose, all of them are equally valid. The most important thing is that you just find a way that you can engage and make sure that you let your legislators know how you're feeling. So let's talk a little bit more about testifying at these hearings. The most important part about why we are here in training and helping you to learn about why you should be testifying and engaging in the process is definitely because legislators very much depend on hearings and engagement from their constituents to learn if there is public support for or against a piece of legislation or the way that they're going to decide for or against funding or any other community issue. Now, um, you do not have to be a direct constituent of someone who is on a committee that has an issue that you care about. You really just have to be a citizen with an opinion on the matter at hand. We do advise that when there are uh, issues that may affect a different municipality, that it can be better if you talk with somebody who actually lives in that district or talk to your own legislator about how you feel about this, because it really is the most important that direct constituents and direct citizens are the ones 
who are engaging with their personal legislators. And just remember, representatives have many, 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 many items to consider over the course of their day, but they're generally going to give the priority to the ones that the citizens advocate and voice concern about. The committee chair can also limit the amount of time that you're speaking, so you want to come already prepared with what you want to say and a general idea of how long it will take for you to say this. Remember, practice makes perfect as long as you're going out there, and the best way to practice is just to complete continuously engaging. Maybe your first time at a hearing may not go as smoothly as you'd like. By the time that it's the 10th time and they know that you're coming and they know what you're going to say, I guarantee that all of those words will just roll off your top. And again, to find out those rules about your specific committee or in your specific city and municipal legislature, we're just going to have you reach out to your local town or city clerk, because that is the person who is there to keep all of the records and management for any kind of municipality, and they are happy to help you. All right, so. For a town meeting, it's a little tiny bit different, guys, but don't worry. It's basically close enough that I think we can whiz through this. Um, when voters are eligible to speak on matters, you can know that you're eligible because you are a person who actually lives inside of your municipality and that you are a registered voter. Very important that you're a registered voter. Um, but non-voters can be eligible to speak, and but it's completely based on the discretion of the moderator. So the easiest way to get around this is just to make sure that you're a registered voter. <laughs> and you should be a registered voter anywhere, guys, but that's probably a whole nother training. <laughs> so after an article, which if you remember is just an agenda item on that warrant, is read, then debate can start. So to speak, you just wait for the moderator to acknowledge you and you stay on the topic at hand because the moderator is actually able to stop and eject any speaker that is not abiding by the rules. So politeness pays in this situation guys. The proper way to introduce yourself as you start for debate is to share your name, address, and word and precinct number if you know it before you share your views. This lets people know exactly what neighborhood you're from and exactly um, where you're going to be affected by whatever the legislation or article is that's coming forward. And again, you can always look up your ward and precinct number in addition to your representation by going to wheredoivotema.com or where do I vote? Not in. But again, guys, don't worry, I'm saying a lot of stuff, but check those handouts, the great handouts. <laughs> now, I said earlier that the state house can't just make up laws for the cities and towns that they have. They really need to actually listen to their local government if they'd like to make changes in local government. However, in a reverse of that, did you know that your city or town can actually make rules that go through the state house, but only affect their municipality? This is actually called home rule petition. And we use this because municipalities have somewhat limited powers under state laws. Some of the issues that cannot be addressed at the local level without this mechanism include regulating local elections, loving assessing and collecting taxes, private civil laws, imposing criminal penalties, or like in the case of Birmingham, switching their entire form of government. Um, some things that you've probably seen in the news also include um, redeveloping certain government owned public housing or perhaps increasing the amount of liquor licenses that your municipality has. These are all powers that are held by the state according to our state constitution, but that can be given or transferred in limited ways to our towns using uh, the method called home rule petition. So if you would like to learn a little bit more about home rule petitions, you're in luck because that's the next slide. <laughs> so let's talk a little bit about this very special mechanism. So for home rule petitions only affects the municipality that filed it. If something is filed in Boston, it doesn't affect Framingham. If something's filed in Weymouth, it doesn't um, affect Worcester. It's only for your actual municipality. And it must pass through your local hearing process, whether that's in a traditional town meeting or whether that's in city council. It's brought forward the same way that any other ordinance is. So it is introduced, there is a public hearing and discussion, perhaps a working session for any amendments or changes that are needed, brought forth back before the body for a vote, sent over to your mayor for a signature. And then after that whole process is done, 
similar to how we would pass a normal ordinance, it is sent over to the state house to go through their process. There's also a second way that we can look at home rule petitions or the actual ability of citizens to enact things on the state level. And that is the right to free petition. This is a very, very, very special mechanism that is completely unique to Massachusetts. And it means that any citizen, so every single person who's on this chat right now can submit a bill to the legislature. Legislators will usually file those on your behalf, and it doesn't even matter if the legislator supports it necessarily, just as a matter of politeness, they will generally file it. And I will be honest that many times that the home that the free petitions do not necessarily come to a vote, but they are in the record, and it is still important to use this mechanism because it is unique to us, and we want to make sure that people are engaged at every single level that is offered to them, including writing their own policy. There are a couple of very famous instances of this, including why we have a steak cookie and why that steak cookie is chocolate chip. And that is because that was actually a homo petition by a group of children who very, very much wanted a chocolate chip cookie to be the steak cookie of Massachusetts. So thank you to that um, small elementary school group and probably Nestle Toll House. So let's talk a little bit about when we do get over to the state house and we have a completely different calendar than we might have at a municipal level or the federal level. Now, I know this looks like a lot, but that's because it's a very, very uh, more complicated process in the state house than it is in our towns and cities to the point where the legislative year is really a two year session where there's a year one and a year two with slightly different dates in between the two of them. So for the joint rules of the legislator has the bill filing deadline for legislators as 5 p.m. on the third Friday in January of the first annual session of the general court. And that can sound a little bit much, which is why it's on the slide for <laughs> you to reference. But the governor, on the other hand, is able to file legislation whenever he wants. Um, technically, legislators can too, but then it would be a late file, and late files are a little bit harder to process and to get through and require more steps of everyone agreeing that it should be put forward. So we generally frown on those and try to stay inside of the actual legislative calendar unless, again, you are the governor, in which case you can do what you'd like when you'd like. You are the governor. <laughs> The general appropriation bill, which is more commonly known as the annual budget, is something that the governor does have to do in a specific amount of time, and that has to be submitted by the end of January, and it's worked on until June 30th. Well, let's be honest, it should be worked on until June 30th, but many times we actually see that there is an extension required to actually finish the work that is on the budget because it is one of the largest things that the state house does and spends the most time on. And it is a way that people do generally turn to do their advocacy on specific line items inside of the budget. So once a bill is filed in the house, or your Senate clerk's office, it's given a docket number and it's recorded in a docket book. And a docket number is really just another way to say a tracking number. And as long as you know the docket number for whatever bill that you're interested in, you can always figure out where it is at any point of the cycle by going over to the State House website. We've also included on those handouts uh, the link to the journal for the House as well as the link to the journal for the Senate. So, and just to let you know, I'm sure you guys would have gotten this already, but anything that starts inside of the House, it has an H in front of it, and any bills that start inside of the Senate will have an S in front of it. The House and Senate each have 11 committees, and there are 29 joint committees, which are any committees that have both the House and the Senate as their members. And again, you can always find more information about this just at malegislature.gov. It's a wonderful uh, site and you should just spend a little bit of time just going around it and figuring out how to navigate it, but also just some fun facts or fun bills that you may not even have known about. Uh, I always am going to advocate for people to spend a couple of minutes just learning some of these municipal and these state websites, because when you need it, that is not the time for you to start learning about how to find these things. So when we do get those bills, they're assigned based on subject matter. So bills are assigned. So 
for example, the Joint Committee on Housing is going to cover all matters concerning Chapter 40B housing, housing in general, subdivision control, condominium laws, and any such other matters as may be referred. And it is up to um, the speaker if they want to put it in a different committee that you may not have thought would have aligned to it. And sometimes these conversations do happen behind closed doors, but there is generally a very specific reason that any bill ends up inside of that particular committee. So. Um, the joint committees hold hearings and they also issue reports on each bill that's submitted. And at some point, the joint committee hears a bill that the committee holds an executive session. An executive session versus all the openness that you can see at a lot of municipal and town levels is actually a closed door. And it's to issue, um, or sorry, the executive sessions are open to the public, but only committee members can speak. So that's really important because I know that I've said many times that you should come and speak in all of this, but for an executive session, it's a little bit more about listening. But don't worry, the public hearing is the first thing that they have to do. And so there's obviously an opportunity really early in there to share your advocacy, to share your voice and to share your opinion on any things that are going to come before the body. Once they've actually had this executive session, the committee then issues a report to the clerk's office, and that's going to recommend some of these possible outcomes that I've listed here. Some of them are that a bill ought to pass and they report it out favorably. Um, they could also say that the bill ought not to pass and they could give what's called a study order. And a study order means that it's sent off to another area so they can learn a little bit more about it and the impacts that it might have on the Commonwealth or that particular municipality. Study orders are good to learn more about something, but it's not exactly the best sign for when you have a bill because a lot of the times that actually ends up in the bill being dead, which a dead bill is just something that there's no more action on and it's not gonna be brought to a vote and bills can die almost at any point in the process really. And but don't lose hope, everybody. There's always another way. And here, uh, the other way that we have is you would have to refile your bill. And refiling just means that any session that something doesn't pass, you do have the option of actually refiling that bill, trying again, maybe changing it a little bit, maybe exact same way if that was how you wanted it to be. But don't worry, even if a bill that you really feel strongly about doesn't make it through this process, there's always a future. <laughs> so let's talk about those joint committees that I in um, that I talked about a little bit earlier. Joint committees are there because they can recommend amendments to make a bill a little bit better or any other little changes to a bill. If the changes are really slight, then uh, the committee's amendments are just attached to the bill and it actually keeps its original bill or docket number. However, it's much more common, uh, especially with any bills that include finances, uh, that the joint committee is actually just gonna redraft the bill completely. <laughs> and if it redrafts the bill completely, then it will be assigned a new bill number from the clerk. And um, if there were similar bills that were sent to the committee, they could also just redraft and pick a bunch of different aspects from the similar bills to make one consolidated bill to bring back to the House and the Senate instead of voting on basically the exact same bill, possibly seven times. So after it comes out of our joint committee, it goes through a process in the legislature that's referred to as three readings. Now, if you are from another state that is involved in advocacy or state level work, or even if you're from the UK and deal with parliament, then you are probably familiar with this term because it's used in several different types of explaining legislatures and this work. So, first reading, that's just automatic, guys. I mean, it's, it's literally when the committee report is just delivered to the clerk or the House or Senate, and it shows up in the journal. That's your first reading. Look, we're already a third of the way through, just very simply, very quickly. <laughs> your second reading is where you're probably gonna be most excited to dig in, and that's your public hearing, um, and that's put on by the committee, and it's open for debate, for the public, for your advocates, for your legislators, and it actually requires a favorable vote usually a voice vote to move forward. And actually let's take a quick note to that 
because I did note that this is a voice vote because many, many times we will have either a voice vote or a roll call vote. And your voice votes are generally to move, are to move things forward and they're basically non-contentious. If there is a little bit of confusion, if the voice vote is very close or if it is something that people want to be on the record, then a legislator can always call for a roll call vote where everyone will have to actually identify who they are and whether they vote yes or no. These are not as common as voice votes though. And again, anytime that you wanna access one of these journals to see like what, where bills are in the process, because the journals will also um, tell you where they are in the process so that you can also go to the clerk's office to see what's on the agenda and the docket for the day. And you should go to malegislator.gov and it's either slash journal slash house or it's slash journal slash Senate, depending on which one that you're gonna look for. And remember, you're just gonna know where it is based on the H or the S in front of your bill number. So let's move on to our last part of three readings, which is the third reading. Third reading actually has its own committee. It's called the Committee on Bills in the Third Reading. And what they are are kind of like our let's just call them our legislative housekeepers. They're gonna go through for our legal technicalities for our proper citations, and to make sure that this bill is not actually just a duplicate of something that already exists inside of the system that might just need to be enforced rather than created anew. Now, while they issue their report, it goes back to the chambers to be debated and possibly amended one more time before it gets engrossed. Now, I know that if you have been listening to the news, you might be very well aware of what a conference committee, but for those who may not have been as plugged in, allow me this time to explain. A conference committee is a group that has both House and Senate members, and it really happens when you have controversial bills, uh, a lot of bills that have to do with finance, criminal justice reform, housing, a lot of these things where it may not be an immediate yes from everybody will end up in a conference committee. And this is because the House could pass one version of a bill and the Senate could pass a completely other version of the bill, but we, have, we can't have these different rules on the books at the same time. We we have to have one consolidated piece of legislation that goes forward to the governor's office to be signed. And that's when you would have a conference committee come into being. So they're always temporary and they are just appointed to they're just appointed at that time to resolve whatever issues are between the two branches. And it's appointed by the Speaker of the House and our Senate president of both chambers. They have three representatives and three senators and one of whom from each of those bodies has got to be a member of whatever the minority party is at that time. None of the work that's done inside of a conference committee is public, but they will announce who is sitting on a conference committee. So if you see that something that you really um, feel strongly about or are paying attention to has gone to conference committee, keep a close eye on announcements on who's named to it so that you know who to call, lobby, or talk to to make sure that your concerns are brought forward and that they will still be there in the final versions of our bills. That's what I assume it looks like by like the third or fourth week. <laughs> so let's talk about where the governor comes into this. Everything is just basically a thought or a dream for a bill until the governor actually um, has it. And it doesn't actually mean until he signs it, because as you can see from this slide, there are ways that things have become laws without the governor actually ever signing it. Traditionally, we do have the bill sent to him. And after 90 days, it becomes a law after he signs it, unless there's called a emergency preamble, which I'm sure you can tell from the word emergency means that it becomes a law immediately. Um, he can also not sign the bill, but it becomes a law anyways, because if they hold the bill for 10 days while the legislature is in session, um, the governor, um, it just becomes, a, it does become a law. If the 10 day period occurs when the legislator has concluded its session, yes, the governor must sign the bill in order for it to become a law. But if it's in session, it can still just become a law. Um, there's also a fun, fun thing that where if the 10 day period occurs when the, um, when they've concluded their session, uh, the governor must sign the bill to become a law, but 
if he doesn't sign a bill, it doesn't become a law. And that's what we call a pocket veto. So this is kind of like, I don't want to say that it's a reward for not doing anything, but it does mean that you cannot do anything and still get yourself a law and you cannot do anything and still have that law denied to you. So not again, passing, either you sign the bill or you don't sign, but it's inside the session. So it does become a law and not passing is outright vetoing the bill, not signing. So it's a pocket veto, or you could also return the bill with recommendations. So it does not become a law and the process starts again <laughs> to go back to the state house. And a very special thing that our governor has is the ability to do a line item veto, which is with the appro appropriations bill, which means that if he does not uh, agree with a particular line item of how money is being spent by the legislature, he can veto that one line item instead of actually returning the entire bill. I know there's so much to this guys, but I promise that it is worth it to engage in this entire process. And I hope that you end this session feeling a little bit more prepared on how to engage in this process. So we're gonna talk a little bit about formal session versus informal session. As I said before, there are some things that are just general non-controversial matters, and that's gonna be um, your informal sessions. Uh, there's actually, you can only have non-controversial issues on which no legislator voices disagreement and that's considered and you can have a approved voice vote for that. Um, if any member objects, any member, <laughs> the matter or motion actually does not advance. In an informal session, even though no attendance is taken, sometimes you'll see like a couple members attend the session, then that's just so that they can be prepared to object if necessary. Um, a lot of times you'll see a representative of the minority priority or someone from like the Progressive Caucus or any members who anticipate that their bills may be approved during that session. Um, a formal session on the other side considers and acts upon those reports of the committees, messages from the governor, petitions, papers from the other branch of government, or um, your orders of the day. So uh, the session can also be extended for emergencies and extenuating circumstances. This year in 2020, we actually did have an extended session, um, but generally, um, according to the joint rules in the first year of the session, Formal sessions end on the third Wednesday in November. That's it. And in the second year of the session, they end on July 31st. We are in the second year, which is why ours was extended after July 31st. So I know that that was just so much information, but guess what? That actually covers it. <laughs> I know it's a lot of process to take in, but honestly, that's what it takes to make some of these laws. And you can see that there is a little bit more easier, quicker, and direct action on that municipal level. And that's because those people need to reply to things that are quality of life issues that can just affect how you wake up in the morning to how you go to sleep at night. But we also want to make sure that we're thinking bigger picture. And that's why we engage with our state legislature for things that can raise up the profile of us all across the Commonwealth. And certainly if we want to raise the profile of the entire country, that's when you can engage with those federal representation, those congressmen and your senators. But for the most part, let's concentrate on our state and our municipal offices and make sure that you're able to look at those handouts and go to organizations like Housing Forward in May, who are just here so that they can help you get involved in this process, because we truly are better together and advocacy is for all of us. So, I am going to stop screen sharing just because I want to make sure that you guys have any questions um, or concerns that I can answer them right now. And again, all you have to do is just put your hand up or you can even just type it in the chat if you have any concerns and I'll try to answer those as best as I can. So, or I, or I could have just done such a great training that all of you are just legislative experts. Okay. <laughs> oh, thank you, Sheridan. I appreciate that. 
Um, but definitely, I want to make sure that you guys do feel that you can go to any of those websites that are listed on your handouts and definitely engage with any of the nonprofits, legislators, or people that you know that you should be able to go to for assistance. So I would suggest following Housing Forward MA on Twitter, on Facebook, and to like their page on LinkedIn, as well as to join their mailing list just to make sure that you're staying aware of all of these wonderful information, resources, and trainings that they're going to bring to you. You. So, um, Executive Director, would you like to come on and close us out for this evening? Uh, well, thank you, uh, Kristen, for that incredibly informative and entertaining uh, session. And thank you all for participating and, and for your interest in our organization, uh, being an advocate when it comes to affordable workforce housing, smart growth uh, in the Commonwealth of Massachusetts and in our cities and towns. As you heard, there are ample opportunities uh, to get involved on the local level where you can make important change uh, in your community and for the Commonwealth and the nation at large. Please keep in touch with us. Don't forget, we have a second session also led by Kristen uh, that will be tomorrow at 5 p.m. Uh, and obviously these will all be recorded and posted on our website moving forward. If you have any questions, you know, hit us up on email, Twitter, Facebook. We're around. We're looking forward to continuing this journey with you all. Thanks so much. Have a great evening and be safe.